All right, welcome back. This is still The Polity, reaching you live from Abuja. I've been joined now in the studio by the SDP presidential candidate for the 2023 general elections, Prince Adewale Adebayo. He joins me now to speak on the issue of false subsidy removal, the cancelled protest of the NLC, and also the impact uh, that Nigerians are currently feeling following that decision. Welcome to the program. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. It's been a while, sir. Yes. Uh, how's it been? Well, it's been all right for the most part. All right. Uh, let's go straight into it. We'll start with um, the most recent updates and perhaps uh, delve into more details. There was to be a strike tomorrow by the uh, Labour uh, Congress and uh, affiliated bodies, but it has been called off after a meeting last night uh, where um, there was a resolution that they would continue negotiations and stall things till June 19th. What's your take on this update and how uh, things have turned out at this moment? Well, I think that um, Nigerians should not assume that the most important thing is what is happening with Labour Congress or Labour leaders. They constitute a very small uh, segment of Nigeria. And the issues at hand, Nigerians have to look at these issues from the point of view of how they want their government to govern them. Because in our system, we've adopted democracy. And in a democracy, there is no government. The people have to form the government. And when people want to form the government, various persons will come and compete to be hired. And they will display to the common people the problems of the country, how they understand it, how they interpret it, and the solutions they have. And these different people, or different sets of people, now come up with their political parties and campaign. At the end, on the day of examination, on election day, the Nigerian people will now decide which set is going to go and form the government. And once that set has been formed, as they are governing, you want to see whether they are keeping to the programs that they gave to the Nigerian people. It's only when they are breaking the law that you can intervene. Otherwise, if they are following what they promised the people, it is not left for the people to assess whether they like it or not. And in the next election, decide whether to continue to renew their mandate or to put another set that can do better. So labor has no role to play in any of this. Labor is supposed to deal with industrial disputes, work conditions, uh, pay conditions, and things like that. So Nigerian people should not like mainstream the discussion. There is no collective bargaining that says that if I form a government and I want to run the government according to the manifesto that I've already sold to the people, I need to carry the permission from labor. There isn't such thing. So, and I've made it clear that on the issue of this subsidy, Labour itself supported the removal of the subsidy. And we have removed, we have uh, done price adjustment over time in this country. And we have done at least one year of subsidy removal. I think we're around 2016. We know the implication that when you remove subsidy, cost will go up. And the common man who has very little uh, amount of money left originally will have none to even cope with uh, procurement of these services. So everybody knows uh, you are not a baby. You know that if you remove subsidy uh, and the price will go up, that's what it means. And if the price goes up, the price of petrol, that transporters will also increase their prices, other people will increase their prices, and the poor who were barely surviving will be hit. So that was why during the campaign there were political parties like mine a presidential candidate like like me who said no 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 don't do it these are the implications and labor decided to inject itself into the politics following one of the political parties a labor party led by uh, peter obi and everything president Inugu is doing now is exactly what peter obi said he would do he will remove subsidy on day one and there's nothing different between the two of them. 
except that maybe labor supported one, they didn't support the other. It is people like us who were on the other side who said, don't do it because of what we are saying now. And but we cannot come, we cannot come out now. I cannot call Shawara now and say, join me, let's go and block the road. No, democracy doesn't allow for that. Democracy says the people will choose the options before them. And once they choose that option, you let the option play through. And by the next uh, uh, election, I can come back and say, hey guys, how are you feeling now? Would you buy a loaf of bread for 12,000 naira? And so what are you going to do about it? And don't you think we need to change course? And if the Eldorado that President Tinubu promised that fuel subsidy removal will lead to a balanced budget, will lead to more investment in infrastructure and all of that. People can remind me and say, well, thank God we didn't choose you. See the person we chose, you remove subsidy, now we have super highways everywhere, uh, our trains are working, education is better, health is better, so let him continue. That's how democracy is done. So I don't want us to assume that as a country, we need to wait for labor leader, uh, whatever. No, they're not relevant at all. Are they not major stakeholders? Yeah. No, they're just part of the stakeholders, but they don't represent... The workers are the stakeholders, not the labor leaders. Don't they represent the they workers? They don't represent the workers because if you are to represent the workers, you have to represent what favors the worker. So uh, somebody cannot come to Captain TV now and say he's a labor leader and agrees with the management that... 90% of the workers will be fired and salaries will be reduced and work hours will be increased. The workers will say, how is that in our interest? That will be the, in the interest of the owner of the business because we increase work, work hours, we reduce wages and all of that maybe it gets better prof profitability. But in the position taken by labor during the election, they didn't negotiate anything for the workers. Maybe they negotiated something for themselves individually that place in position in, 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 in the future government, maybe some uh, spending during the election uh, came their way because they are now part of the campaign process. But the issue is, if you take the manifesto of all the political parties, the manifesto that favored the workers was not where the labor leaders went. So that is the, the crux of the matter. That is why all sides on that side was pointing towards subsidy removal. So it became a consensus. And you will see that the towards the election, the labor leaders were saying, vote for this party. But they didn't state anything inside. You can go and read their letters. They never said anything inside it that vote for this labor party. They will not remove subsidy. Uh, they will increase the salary. They will make, no, 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 they didn't. They just went there where it suited them personally, which is their own personal politics. It's their choice. But what we are bringing out is that Nigerian people cannot be following crisis actors who are just, into my mind, political mercenaries. They are, they, it doesn't mean that what favors you is what they are doing. They are just finding a role for themselves at every stage in the political process. So during the time of party primaries, they found a role for themselves. During the time of general election, they find a role for themselves. During the time of governance, they find crisis roles for themselves. At the end of the day, none of the options that they are bringing to the table is going to change the mind of the government. Because threatening the government, they are going to shut the government, shut the offices down. It doesn't affect the government in, in a way. Because the revenue of the government is not tied to all of, any, of, any of that. The agenda that the people, the interest that the government is taking decisions in favor of, they don't care. So you need to know that every decision taken in government is taking the interests of one group and other group pay the price. But do you believe the NLC or Labour has always been like this? or Because um, uh, it could be said that they've been consistent all the way back to tw um, 2012. They've always been against um, removal of subsidy. No. So uh, is there something different, perhaps because of their affiliations this election cycle, that makes them seem tainted, so to speak. No. You see, labor movement is a very old one. With the, our first labor movement came as anti-colonial. Oh. With the uh, mine workers 
downing tool in Enugu, in Udi, in Enugu, uh, 1945, thereabout. And towards independence, of course, the colonial people were foreigners. And we're all Nigerians. So every segment of society will come together. Market women, uh, uh, housewives, whoever, farmers, hunters, uh, academic people, uh, professionals, everybody could come together to say the white man should go. So for that reason, the Nigerian people saw the labor movement as one center for mobilization of agitation against oppression. Then when we got independence, that political parties came into being. Mm. Labor at that time realized that the interests of the working classes and the political class are not the same. Therefore, Pai Modu and the rest of the uh, uh, Comrade Sumano and many of the uh, dialectically uh, well-trained labor leaders knew that there are no differences in these political parties. So don't go and get yourself too much involved in them, but understand the need of your workers. Better welfare, uh, better working condition, better pay, and the put their management of the economy to ensure that the poor man does not uh, uh, bear the bond. And they started looking for political parties who, who wanted to listen to them. So any political party that listened to them, they will inject the interest of the workers into your manifesto. So one way or the other, if you say you want free education, free health care, uh, and all of that, they know you hire more teachers, you hire more doctors, so you create more space for people to, to be creative. And the children of workers will have access to these amenities. If you say better housing, they will support you. Whichever party it was, they were going there not supporting individuals for reward. They were going there to carry the agenda, the platform of labor and the common people into it. And people like Otegbaye made a, a, a complete um, circle of it by even saying that the workers ought to have their own workers' party, which will promote their interests. So then when we, military rule came, labor was part of civil society. Because at that time when military rule came, the military were the oppressive class because nobody gave them power. And whatever way they justify coming to power, they could only sustain power by being oppressive and not brooking any opposition. So political parties had been prescribed. So civil society was what was left and labor was a component of that. So labor was on the side of the people and we were pushing together and people in Nupeng and all those uh, the, uh, Asu and and all of them became a uh, bulwark of resistance to military rule. Then 1999 came. Labour also stepped back, realizing that between PDP, AMPP, AD, there isn't much you can do. There are now political parties protect the interests of labour. Then as time went on, government policy will come, and you saw what Adam Oshimole and Co were doing with respect to uh, managing the issue of fuel subsidy, non regime subsidy, and all of that, and the issue of pension, and so many other issues. But they were negotiating with government on issue of policy that affected workers. And in some cases, civil society would also incorporate labor in the order to resist the government on something that they thought was inimical to civil society. But you will not find them, Shomole, as NLC president. Ayubawaba, I know those people, they will not go and join PDP, APC. Uh, no, 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 they will not. Of course, uh, Shumali, after retiring from NLC, went to choose one party and became governor there. That's his own individual capacity. But they didn't carry the labor movement into their political party. And this is where those who are there now have failed woefully. They've abandoned their leadership of the, uh, of the working classes that they represent to become part of the tools of politics. And in doing so, they became dialectically suicidal. They committed ideological suicide by going to join political parties that have programs that are anti-workers. So when right-wing politics, right-wing policies are now being implemented by the dominant political party. They have lost the credibility to criticize it because they had endorsed them, those same policies, in the party that they were joining. 
So that is where it, they will now look like an opposition party rather than acting in the interest of the common people. So that's where the problem lies. So you cannot be a medical doctor who is the Surgeon General of, of the country and you are the one to advise us on health and other issues. And then you go and join a company that sells cigarettes and you are having them to advertise the cigarette. And then after that you come and say smoking is bad for your health. People will say, who are you? You have to stand in one place. So that is where the, the problem lies. And I knew, I'm happy that they didn't do any of this strike because they, they didn't mean to do any strike, they just wasting everybody's time. What they were trying to do is just to pretend that they are still working on the side of the people and then go to the government and then get pacified somehow uh, unknown to the workers and then they just botch the whole drama and then it's things over. What is clear now is that with the connivance of labor leaders, the ruling classes have managed to impose a long-held um, punitive measure of blaming the poor for the fraud which government people and their friends in businesses committed on the fuel subsidy program. Because the fuel subsidy program is not the only program that the government has that has subsidies in it. There are other subsidies that government gives to rich people, like tax holiday if you want to set up a business, like creating an um, economic processing zone for you, export processing zone, where local government will not come and tax you, uh, state will not come and tax you, labor laws will not apply directly there, and you can do whatever you like just for you to be able to do your business. So, by the subsidy, which is given to the taxi driver, so that he can be able to operate his car and carry a few passengers, is withdrawn. Why? Not because that taxi driver went to the fueling station and bought fuel without paying and abused the subsidy. No. Not that he bought fuel inside his car and carried to Cameroon to go and sell. Not that the woman who is running a small restaurant on this, uh, near the street and has a small uh, 4 kVA, 5 kVA generator, uh, buys petrol at subsidized rate and stores it somewhere and sells it to a Cameroonian or Nigeria. No. It is the case that the people in government are using the subsidy money to run their campaign. They are using the subsidy money to store money aside. And now, after they've exhausted all of that, they now say that the poor people should pay for it. That was why I was against it. But it is now the law of the land. It is now the popular policy of the people. The people heard them when they were saying it. And they have no mouth now to say, oh, Tinubu has brought bad luck to us, he has brought punishment to us because they were there when he was campaigning that you can protest from now to next year. You can protest for as long as you want. I am going to remove subsidy and I will still go to win the election. And both came to pass. They won the election, removed the subsidy. So the people cannot say they didn't know. And the second party that they also followed, PDP, also through Atipuku Abubakar, a former vice president, said he was going to remove the subsidy unconditionally. And the third party, which they could also follow, uh, Peter Obi of the uh, Labour Party, which this Labour Union, you can see them uh, following them up and down, campaigning wearing uniform and clapping hand up and down. All of them also said they will remove subsidy on day one. And the parties who said, don't do it, you will suffer, people are going to trek, a lot of problems will come, minimum wage will be useless and if you increase minimum wage the money itself will be useless because inflation will catch up and the money will not buy anything so if your salary is fifty thousand now and they double your salary to hundred thousand the hundred thousand will not buy what the fifty thousand used to buy therefore don't do it there are other things you can do they ignore those parties they follow these people this is the result of it all right uh, what do you make about maybe the skepticism of people when you say subsidy could have continued uh, taking into account that the minister of um, finance budget and national planning former minister pardon me and um, mr zena Bamen, said that the country had been borrowing to pay subsidy and then when you take a look at the issues of um, our refineries uh, federal government also revealed in the last administration that over 13 trillion naira had been spent in 16 years <coughs> and it's it's it basically yielded nothing 
in four years, would there have been enough time to walk back all of these deficiencies and actually, you know, create a system where subsidy wouldn't end up hurting the country? Because there are people who make analogies that um, removing subsidy is not, uh, perhaps if Nigeria is a man digging a hole, removing subsidy is not that um, uh, he has, uh, uh, the hole is getting filled. It is simply that he has stopped digging, but he's still in a hole. So, you know, how would the government work continuing subsidy, given these issues? You don't punish the innocent for the confessional statement of the guilty. Those who are managing the subsidy mismanage it. It doesn't mean that the beneficiaries are at fault. So, it's like you run a school that has a dormitory where children of the poor or less privileged children come to eat. If you discover that the headmaster and the housemaster combine together with the cook have stolen all the money meant for feeding the children and they're diverting the bags of rice and everything, are you going to say, because of this, we will not feed the children anymore? They should staff. No. You make sure you change the management Fire the principal, recover the money. Fire the housemaster, recover is, the is money. Is that recovery possible? It is possible if the person who is in charge of it is not part of... They cannot say, to sir, why are you trying to arrest us? Even one bag of rice was sent to your wife yesterday, and 100 bags of rice were given to you last year. So why are you now talking? This is where the dilemma is. And that's why we tell Nigerian people, if you want to make a clean break, make a clean break. If you haven't made up your mind to make a clean break, you can be experimenting within the same group. You will just be here for a long time. The issue is this. The amount of money spent in the name of subsidy did, were not necessarily spent for subsidy. They are inflating it. And it's not only in the subsidy subsector or su subsidy program that they do that. They do that in everything. If government says, I build 200 kilometers of roads, with X amount, you know that that money could have built a thousand kilometers of roads. If government says we spend one trillion on the armed forces, if you go to the armed forces and get what's actually on ground, it's not up to one third of that. So if you have to eliminate every program that has corruption in it, there will be no government program left. Because even on payroll, paying salaries of workers, we find out that many people have been charged to court. Many are supposed to even go to jail because of mismanagement of the payroll. So are you going to say that you are not going to pay workers anymore because you want to abolish payroll fraud? So what I'm saying in essence is that I, we had this alternative. The reason why I'm still emphasizing it, after having uh, contested on that basis and people said they'd rather go with subsidy remov removers, is that... It should be on record, abundantly on record, that subsidy removal is a solution found by APC, PDP, and Labour Party uh, as a way to curb the financial burden of subsidy. However, there was an alternative way propounded by uh, President Wale Adibayo of SDP, which said that you didn't need to do that, that you could actually get about 35 or 50 people who are involved in this uh, subsidies come and actually recover your money from them why not deny people of uh, ability to have reasonable costs to survive cost of living mm. and i also went for that to say that if you remove the subsidy the money you save will still be stolen by the same set of people they will only move from subsidy if they've exhausted their opportunity to steal the subsidy and you take the money towards rural construction the same cover the same forest will go towards that side too so the duty to eliminate corruption, wherever it is found in government, is enshrined in Chapter 2 of our Constitution. And it's the existence of corruption in any government program is not a reason to eliminate that program. The duty of the government is to eliminate the corruption in that program. Otherwise, you will not give scholarship very soon because you will discover, and you also have seen, that even the scholarship given to militants, rehabilitation, and all those things has a lot of corruption in it. If you go to the Niger Data Development Commission, NDC, everyday allegations, corruption, right there. 
So you are not going to say now you abolish Niger Delta development because its uh, revenue is leaking from there. If you go to aviation, if you go to any of these programs, you will see that, or departments, you will see that this corruption is going on there. When Buhari came into government in 2015, the first scandal we had was the arms procurement scandal and all of those things. Are you going to eliminate the army because you want to deal with, uh, because of corruption? You say, well, because government is spending, government spend more money on ammunition and arms and the defense than on subsidy. And a lot of the money is, there are evidence training them, trials and all of that going on about how all that money was diverted. Are you now going to abolish the armed forces because of that? So there is corruption inside the villa. Are you going to abolish the villa because of that? So you cannot use the presence of corruption as a basis to eliminate a program which has some benefit to the people. Except you come and say, there is no benefit to the common people in the assistance of the subsidy. Therefore, the money is a waste. But I don't think so. And I think that by my calculation when I was running for office, I will reduce the spend, spending on subsidy from $4 trillion to around $900 billion. So majority of the money will be used for something else. And I will abolish, uh, I will have abolished corruption in other sectors too. In that case, you have more money in the cover, and then we also expand government revenue. It can be done. I hope that's what President Tinubu would incorporate into his program. But merely removing subsidy will not help you. Uh, I know, let me just give you two examples. We used to have four subsidized products before in this fuel subsidy business. We used to have four. We used to subsidize kerosene, dual purpose kerosene for common domestic use and for aviation. We used to um, subsidize petrol. We used to subsidize diesel, which is called AGO. We used to subsidize LPFO, low power fuel oil, which heavy industries we used to run their machine. So we were subsidizing all of them. Now, government removed subsidy completely in three of them. No subsidy of kerosene. That's why the poor people pay a thousand plus for one liter. Uh, because of that, they can't use that giant um, kerosene stove anymore. They just get fire, firewood or coal or charcoal and put little uh, petrol, um, kerosene to ignite it. We don't subsidize diesel anymore. That's why many enterprises are closing down, shutting their hours, even banks, because they cannot afford the cost of that. We don't even touch a PFO anymore. What happened to the savings? that we made from those three that were eliminated before. Why has the saving not helped us to balance our budget? Why has the saving not helped us to do roads, to do other things? And if you look at the 2023 budget, the money saved, half a year money, saved in the subsidy, is already gone. And we had to even go and borrow money, including borrow $800 million from the World Bank to even deal with the immediate uh, shocks of the subsidy. So long and short of it is that it won't solve your problem. It's just one more blow on the already battered head of the poor man. All right. Uh, you've, you've mentioned, um, you know, punishing the masses due to um, excesses of the ruling class or the political class. Um, so now I, I have two questions now. Um, take, for instance, the PDP candidate came out recently to say that he would have ruled out palliatives so in that instance, I'd like to get your thoughts on now that it has happened, uh, like you said, the people have made their choice, you know, what the government could do in terms of easing um, uh, the, the pains. And then on the other side, the issue of um, just the poor suffering this and not the ruling class. Take for instance, um, recently, I, I, I forget the, the particular word, but about 30 billion uh, Naira is said to be in the works to be distributed amongst them. Um, uh, the lawmakers are some sort of um, benefits. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, what, what can be done on that level? I mean, the ruling class, the government, the, the elites, so that it seems as though uh, when a, a poor, uh, one of the poor masses has to trek some kilometers, he knows that somewhere some uh, rich man also has to give up, you know, something in the government. Uh, so how do you think that could work in this um, uh government this new dispensation where we see that the people at the end of affairs seem to be suffering 
if not as much, but on a, uh, on a proportionate level, as much as uh, the masses whose subsidy has been taken away. Okay. The illusion that the rich will suffer with the poor is poor man's nightmare. Mm. It cannot happen. So, the risk is, is, is if you are waiting, or the government specifically, uh, the, you if you have a government of rich people, mm. a government for rich people, it is their government. When the tenure of a government is coming to an end and you want to form another one, that is when all of us are equal, and that is why you form a government that favors you. The rich people in a country are not offenders they're not necessarily bad people but they will, they have what you don't have they have money so they will put their money to politicians political parties and candidates that will continue to help them to remain rich and comfortable so they don't have number because the number of rich people are few is few so but uh, the number is low so now the total population of rich people is, is, is quite uh, a minority. But they have majority of the money. 1% of people in Nigeria have 99% of all the money in Nigeria. So if you play politics of money, they will always win. Because one man can give 1 billion naira to a candidate, and the candidate will be all over the media, and that candidate can hire you to be tweeting against your own interests because of money. They can even hire, pay you to wear their t-shirt where they will say uh, the rich will get richer. You, 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 because you want their money, you wear it and enjoy yourself. You may also go and vote for them. In which case, from the day the president gets to the Eagle uh, um, Square to swear in himself, he has already paid them on that day. You will notice that when President Tinubu said subsidy is gone, the next business day, the next day, the stock exchange, the few people who have stocks there got 1.5 trillion increment in their wealth one day. So if Tinubu spent only one day, the people who have those shares, who own those companies, have already become 1.5 trillion richer that day because they voted in a government that succeeded in helping their business by making that pronouncement that is the sophistication of the rich people that is why you will never find them to come and suffer with you so when president Tinubu makes that comment the policies president Tinubu is initiating now even though i ran against his government even though i ran against his candidature is benefiting me because certain benefits go to you if you are already wealthy, whether the government sees you or not. If it's making, we are making those policies, making sure that your business goes smoothly. It is for the common people to understand that the only thing you have which the rich people don't have is your ability to form government with your vote. So if the, you are now very large in number, then you need to use that land number to negotiate things that will favor you and things that are your, of your interest like your welfare like education like employment like uh, low cost of living and things like that they will help they will favor you but if you, uh, during the election you get carried away by religion ethnicity and other fanciful uh, things and you now allow the government to be formed without much consideration to your interest it's, so you cannot expect me as a politician to go to Aliko Dam Gote now and give him t-shirts, face cap, and the music, and bag of rice, and say that I will fix the price of petrol so that nobody selling cement can sell it more than this amount. He will not be happy with me because he understands that that's against his, his interest. But the common people, you can go to them, give them t-shirt, give them this, give them that, and enunciate policies that are against their interests. They will not be uh, conscious of it, or they will not care. Even if they are aware of it, they will just say, okay, mm -hmm. we give up. So that is why I'm saying that you cannot now, after you have formed the government, 
start to persuade and reach and talk that the people who have won the political power should not use it in their interest. Where the whole purpose of putting their money, putting their effort, putting everything, is to use it to their own purpose. So they can, they've got the power. So you cannot tell a hunter who spent the whole night uh, hunting, climbing trees, doing everything, job, and after catching the game, you said you should release the game to go. Why will he do that? Why is he doing all of that effort? You should know that even though we are all Nigerians, our interests will not be the same. So the chances of cutting cost of governance are slim? Is that it? They will not cost cost of governance because when you were giving them political power, you did not insist that they should cut the cost of governance. It is not part of the mandate you gave to them. And when they were talking, they never said they will cut the cost of governance. So why would you now be imposing on them programs that are not theirs? So Chinubu is not Showare. So you cannot bring Showare policies to him. Atiku Abubakar is not Adebayo. You cannot bring Adebayo's policies to them. So a Tinubu government will look like a Tinubu's government. And if you look at the hope, again, um, renewed hope, I was hoping again, the renewed hope document of Tinubu, that's why all journalists like you should be reading. It is only those things he promised there that you can be talking about. You cannot change his manifesto for him when he has used that manifesto to win the election. He believes that the people love that manifesto. And if you take his manifesto, you put it side by side, Atiku Abubakar's PDP manifesto and Peter Obi's Labour Party manifesto, they look alike. So their manifestos are alike. So each of them will have done it. Maybe the, the voice will be different. Maybe the standing will be different. But the purpose of the policy will be the same. So people should understand that a democracy is not a perpetual argument. A democracy is that you argue people vote. Then that issue is rested. You raise another issue, you argue, people vote. So we've argued all of these things before the election. And people have voted for political parties that have these policies that President Tinubu is implementing. Therefore, you can only be finding things like one, are they breaking the law? If they're not breaking the law, why are you complaining? Or if they change their mind, and they are not implementing what they promised. You can say, oh, you deceived me to get my vote. That is why I joined people who were critical of President Buhari, who said, I will fight corruption, I will deal with um, insecurity, and I will revamp the economy. But in all those three, people could say, ah, well, you said you're going to do this, you didn't do it. But in this particular president, now, he has not spent more than a week and it's already implementing what he said he will do. The fact that what he's doing doesn't favor you does not mean I have much sympathy for you. You, you get the point I'm making because in reality, you have given me the mandate to go and do what he said he was going to do and he's doing exactly what he said he's going to do. It is for you to reflect and say, okay, maybe I didn't understand the implication of what he was going to do. Maybe I didn't know the meaning. Maybe I didn't even pay attention to the manifesto at all. I don't say, oh, maybe because I didn't vote for him. I voted for that person. No, you compare his program with the program of the person you voted for. You will realize that you, the person will do exactly the same thing as well. So it is people who are maybe on our side, uh, minority as we have become now, who are on our side, who will now recommend to their colleagues and say, that's why we told you to follow this other side. You can see, if it's this other side now, you will not be facing what you're facing. And it's a continuous dialogue. It doesn't mean that the president doesn't love the people. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love the country. It just means that his approach is what we have seen before, that this approach would hurt you. It's like having two dentists uh, try to treat toothache. One thing is that I can just apply a plier and put the tooth out. One might say, no, why are you going to do that? The person will feel so much pain. So maybe you don't have to do that. Maybe you just uh, give the person some painkillers 
and then localize the pain to one particular place, and after three days, the person will not feel it again. But both of them are doctors, so it just depends on what which doctor you want to choose. So that is the situation we find ourselves now. And in a democracy, you can't change your mind after the election. All right. Uh, very quickly, um, before we move over to the way forward, you know, because uh, we've talked about the problems, I just you know like your thoughts on one more issue: the manner in which this was done. Um, it was um, at the inaugural speech, subsidy is gone. Uh, as that speech was ongoing on social media, uh, in the streets everywhere, people started saying, go out and get for now. You know, it's almost as though the average Nigerian was aware of what a simple statement from the president would do, um, perhaps more than the president himself. So uh, the question is, in the manner in which this has happened, uh, what, what's, your, what are your, what's your thoughts on it? Especially because one of those candidates who ran the PDP candidate said he was going to roll out, he would have rolled out palliatives. And others, you know, argue, I believe you were on a program with um, one of the uh, labor uh, persons who said they had an agreement, they were going to speak and talk and dialogue before uh, the labor party candidate would have removed it. So what can you say about the manner in which this was done? Was this really, even though it's not a, a, a move you agree with, was this the best way to do it? The way you see, when the president made that inaugural, you, I don't know if you saw my tweet. I tweeted that because I knew what would happen. I tweeted that why is he even doing saying this? Because it will call, it will send shocks. He ought to announce the the, the he ought to mention the the shock absorbers, as I put it, in the program. However, I told her that he knew what he was doing because we I assumed that he was announcing, he was just mentioning a policy that will end in June. But apparently he wanted it to end that day. Maybe because he's an accountant and realized that why am I waiting for June anyway? It makes no difference. So let me just do it right away. Then those who say that they will have rolled out this and that, don't believe them. Because what they said during the campaign was that they would do it immediately. The Labour Party candidate whom that um, Labour leader you mentioned was supporting said not one day will pass. Not one day will pass in his government that will be, be without removing the subsidy. It means that he will remove it right there from Eagle Square or immediately after leaving Eagle Square, but it will be the same day. You see the same effect. So, and as for Vice President Atiku Abubakar, who said he will have rolled out um, palliatives. During, go and read his manifesto, he rolled out no palliatives inside it. In fact, not, his, his case is even the worst. Because not only will he have stopped the subsidy, he will sell the NNPC as a whole. So, not only will he remove subsidy, he will sell the place where the subsidy is coming from. So, it's not like someone who says, I will stop giving you food from the warehouse. I will even set the complete warehouse. There will be no warehouse anymore. So uh, what he's just doing now is hypocritical. He just try to find a voice uh, because of the agitation arising from his colleague's uh, announcement. And furthermore, none of the palliatives that they want to announce, whether palliative by Labour Party, palliative by PDP, palliative by APC, that is not already in the 2023 budget. Already, it's there. So it's like saying that you are going to take a hammer and a nail and nail somebody's skull, but you supply sufficient number of Panadol, a tablet of Panadol for the person. There is no way, even with the Panadol, that the person will not feel that pain in the head. And how long are you going to give the Panadol for the next 20 years? So we will say, don't even nail somebody skull with a uh, hammer and nail don't even do it at all there are better ways to do it but you cannot say well before nailing the person's head with the hammer i will have given the person five tablets to take first in preparation for it it doesn't make any difference so what we want them to understand is that this is a bad policy but it is no longer a bad policy it's a bad policy in economics but it's, no longer, it's, but it's not a bad policy in politics. Because in politics, 
you can have a bad policy that the economists don't like, but the people support. There are some countries like the UK. In economic sense, it makes no sense to send away immigrants from their country because numbers have shown over the years that the more immigrants they brought to their economy, the better for their economy, including for the immigrants and for the people who are indigenous. But a politician can go and tell the people that I'm going to chase away immigrants. It is a good policy if he wins the election on that basis. And after winning the election, sends away all the good people. The people will suffer the effect, but you will say, but he said he was going to do it. It is, do you understand the analogy? So it is not that a policy has to be agreeable with me before I will say he has the right to implement it. Because if he has a mandate, when the UK population said they should leave the EU, everybody who understands economics knows that this is a very unwise decision. Why will you leave? Makes no sense. Your economy will suffer and you will not recover. You will suffer all the, most of the problems of the union without taking any of the benefits of the union. So you may as well just stay. But the election after election, they voted for the parties that said they would quit the EU. So the prime minister who didn't want to quit resigned. Another person came and took them out of the EU. They are suffering the effect now. But it makes no sense economically, but I cannot go to the UK now, or if I was a UK politician, I cannot be raising the issue of EU again. You know, except when, after some time, the population become aware that, okay, this was a, a monumental error taken in the past, and they want to correct it. Then it becomes an issue again. The issue of subsidy is no longer under debate. President Chinubu has confirmed President Buhari's action, which is to remove the subsidy. Now, people have to live with it. The people will suffer massively as a result of it. They will also suffer as a result of any other thing that the government is going to do. Now, are, are they allowed to complain, even if they voted for You it? can complain. Oh. You can complain. But your, your complaint should start from acknowledging the fact that the person you authorized to do it. It's like a person who sold his house. I later realized I should have sold my house. And it's passing by every day, looks at another person, enjoying the house. You can't collect the house back, and you cannot go and arrest the agent who you authorized to sell the house. But you can cry in front of the house. Hopefully you don't disturb the person who is the new owner. You can say, you can tell, carry all your children there and say, let, let me tell you something about life. Don't make a stupid decision like I did. This house used to be our house. I sold it. Don't ever try that again. You can learn a lot of lessons from it. You, you get the problem. Like you can tell the person who bought the house not to throw your property out of the house, to allow you to come and pack it uh, decently. You can tell the government to implement this policy in a manner that uh, is the least inconvenient to you. But a, a drastic program like this, the even as delicate as the government will want to be about it, is they cannot remove 90% of the crisis even if you told me to come and remove subsidy and i'm the president maybe i will try on my best maybe i will it will be two percent less painful than tinubu's pain but there's no way to do it because of the nature of the, the transcendental nature of that product so if you remove subsidy on fertilizer for example there's no way it will not affect farmers you cannot say, well, no, unless you find an alternative fertilizer for them or something. What they can do in Nigeria now is if government suddenly becomes highly interested in public transportation and they say, okay, your concerns about transport, we will remove the subsidy, but you can still use a hundred naira card to travel all over the city for the whole day. You can use a three hundred naira card to travel around the city for the whole day. So why are you complaining? That is what they did in the, in the UK. They don't fix the price of their, uh, of, their, of their petroleum products. It just goes on like that. However, if you are in the city of London, you have Oyster card. An Oyster card, you, have, you pay an amount per month or per week 
up a day and up a trip. It's up to you. But they've managed to make sure that the cost of transportation is not more than a certain percentage in the income of the average worker. Right, sorry so the control of those uh, things. Uh, uh, Bayo, um, you are delving into the second part of the conversation now. So uh, we'll just go for a quick break. Let's hear what some Nigerians, uh, how some Nigerians are reacting to the change. And then when we return, we'll head into the issues of solutions now that everything has happened. All right, uh, take, let's take a look at that report. When we return, the program continues. Stay with us. Nara Palita, after the announcement of the subsidy removal by President Bola Hakmed Tinubu, as monitored in Abiyokuta, the Ogun State Capital, some of the few stations remain closed while others have maintained the new price. The situation, as it were, has exponentially affected cost of living. Transport fare within the metropolis have increased substantially, while prices of other essential commodities have been affected, leaving residents to groan under the current price regime. Matter of fact, since uh, the pronunciation of the new president, uh, the price, the increase in price of fuel, of petrol, have been biting hard on the citizenry. As a matter of fact, it has been affecting our business. I can tell you categorically well that since Monday, up to date, we know how many vehicles we normally load in this motor park. These are these different units now. I mean, the one that, comes, that uh, goes to Ikorodu, the ones that goes to Isho Osho, the ones that goes to Idumota. But since the increment in the fuel price, People have not been coming forth. There have been a serious reduction in how commuters have been coming since Monday. While emphasizing on the effect of this new development, residents call for measures to ameliorate the current situation. I have helped us very well. Like the place where we are carrying uh, 200 before, it's 300 now. We don't see passengers. Self. Some people know if you enter, you know if you carry 300 nera moto, 300 nera three tricycle. He affect us. Ah, may government, may them please and please and please, may them help us. Do anything we can do. We can help us to bring this thing down. If it's not 300 nera, we go still manage them, but this 500 now is too much for us. Really affected our business in the sense that everything has gone high. And when things are high like that, the price of goods are high like that, it's not everybody that, that will be able to afford to buy. So as a result, it will, it will reduce the rate at which people patronize us. So I, 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 it, it's, not, it's not really easy. It's not really easy. It could be recalled that President Bola Hakmed Tinubu's inaugural speech on Monday, the 29th of May, was instantly greeted by sudden fuel scarcity after he mentioned the removal of fuel subsidy. From Abiyokuta, Jumoke Adebari, reporting for Captain Television News. All right, welcome back. This is still the policy. Uh, I'm still in the studio here with uh, Prince Adewale Adebayo, the 2023 SDP presidential candidate. Uh, you just heard there some Nigerians lamenting the current state of things. Now that things have happened, what uh, could you advise on the way forward, you know, to just help Nigerians uh, with their current predicaments? No, the way forward is already in their government. Mm. The government they elected to remove the subsidy already has way forward. They said they will borrow $800 million and they will address it to the um, to f the 50 million poorest Nigerians. But as I do the calculation of that money, there isn't, that's not a lot of money and it won't last a lot of time. So, but there are other things that the government said they will do. Uh, they will manage the exchange rate. Hopefully that would uh, increase um, commerce in, in the economy and more people will be hired. But they said they want to reduce interest rate, uh, so which suggests to me that they want to fight inflation. But they can't fight inflation if factor cost is rising uh, the way it is rising now. So they, they should pay more attention to what the government has in stock. Uh, the idea of saying advise government, advise government, you need to understand that every political party has their own program. And the program that Tinubu is, President Tinubu is implementing is his own program, Renewed Hope. That's not my program. And uh, I can talk from here to tomorrow, he's going to implement his program. Because 
until he sees that his program has problems. He will not listen to other people because he believes that he has a trajectory. And I've seen his speech. He is a neoliberal economic uh, speech. Mm -hmm. And he has certain foreign investors, uh, certain multilateral and bilateral agencies. Uh, he has the Bretton Woods institutions. He has the bankers. He has all these people's interests at heart. And his belief is that they are going to reciprocate by flooding the economy with investment, with foreign exchange, and he can actually stabilize things. Uh, so, if that works for him, then people might like him. But if that one doesn't work, so people like me, I don't rely on such things. I rely more on <coughs> managing my economy effectively. I rely on the productivity of my people. I rely on um, making sure that government money is not easily accessible. All right, so sorry to so you things like that. Uh, let's just quickly hear from one of our callers here. Um, hello, good afternoon. Uh, this is the Polity. What's your name and where are you calling from? Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. What's your name and where are you calling from? I'm Fachi Arola. I'm calling you from Japoese. All right, please go ahead with your contribution. Uh, good afternoon to the LDC candidates in the house, the former. <laughs> good, good afternoon, uh, sir. Um, please, uh, good afternoon, Prince Adeola, the employer. Please, uh, I want to, uh, in my own opinion, it's true that the three leading presidential candidates talk about removing poor subsidies. But the thing is that I may have opinion about a particular, you know, to uh, have a theory, but the plan or how I'm going to go about it might be different from how the other might go about it. So, what I want to say is that truly the way uh, the presidential <coughs> candidate of, I mean, the way Peter of this did talk about it, and people of Uwaka did talk about it, but how Peter of this wanted to go about it is Another thing entirely different from the way, I don't know how Atiku Abubaka wanted to go about it, but I know that he, there is some, there is nothing, you know, there is nothing uh, different from what is happening now that he would have introduced. But mm -hmm. I want to talk about what Peter Oti said that he was going to do. I think he talked about removing like 50% of the subsidy and he talk about how he's going to channel it to cushion some effect, you know. So you can't just come out like that and uh, you know make a statement. As being a president of a country, your word contain a lot of weight. All right. What he said at that time is just like you know where you know it's as if he was still on the campaign ground. He, All right. he shouldn't have said something like that. So, All right. Thank you. And. Uh, he has no plan on ground before mentioning something like that. Thank you. So thank he you. himself is saying that he reaction in the town. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for calling. All right. I think um, this might be one of those persons who... It's yeah, a part uh, of lack of clarity. Oh. People don't understand. Uh, the gentleman uh, he spoke well, but he's wrong. Because he didn't read the manifesto of the Labour Party on the subject. There's no such thing. The Labour Party candidate said he will remove you on day one. And on day one, there's no National Assembly to pass any program for you. On day one, you are bound by the existing uh, Appropriation Act. So the President doesn't have, it doesn't, you don't go to a good square with money in your pocket. It's government money. So if you want to, if you say you are going to remove subsidy on day one, it means that you are going to follow Buhari's policy. Kobuari had removed the subsidy for all of us. When all of us were contesting election, Buari had already removed the subsidy. But he put he first put the date at the end of his tenure. Later, he shifted it one month so that whoever will come in would have the ability to decide if he will continue with his idea or he will say. So if I was the one there, I would have said, well, subsidy was removed before I came, but I will suspend the idea of the removal. I would rather go and deal with the audit. But I think and, uh, uh, Peter Obi had committed themselves that on day one they were going to remove it. And if you go through, you can, you are a journalist, you can go through 
the manifesto of Labour Party, none about uh, 50 percent. No, he said all of it has to go. Mm. Secondly, there is nothing they say they want to do by way of palliative that Boy has not already done. People should go and read the 2023 Appropriation Act. You will see that Buhari had done so many palliatives inside. And the argument I'm making is that when you remove subsidy completely, whether you are Atiku Abubaka, you are uh, Peter Obi, you are Buhari, you are Chinobu, you cannot stop what is happening now. Because factor costs will rise. You want to struggle with minimum wage and other um, salaries and wages generally. You will deal with the issue of inflation. You, this is the implication of it. But people can uh, continue to assume that if their own person was there, you know, it's, so it's just like uh, a, a woman who is beaten up in the market brutally by one man, and she says, Oh, if you were my husband, you will have beaten me up, but in another way, you will not have used a bathroom slipper to slap my face, you will have used his finger instead. It is like that. You are just, uh, it's a Stockholm Syndrome. You are just trying to excuse the abuse in the first place. You, there are only two broad outlines you can take. Outline one, that since corruption is the problem of subsidy, and I have called it a crime, President Buhari was the first to call it a crime, I call it a crime, Peter will be called it a crime. Since all of us agree that it's a crime, who are the criminals who commit the crime? You see the man riding Okada? Or see the man riding the kind of pet? You see the woman who is firing a car with kerosene? Is that the person who is responsible for the crime? No. Why would you now leave those who have become billionaires out of subsidy and they are enjoying their billions and they are facing the villa coming out, they are donating money to politicians, they are everywhere. You leave them untouched. Then you now go and yank the well-being of common people. But you can see that the gentleman there is an articulate Nigerian, he's a highly intelligent Nigerian. He still sees some good in removal of subsidy. That is why I say I will stop complaining about it. Because it is not my head that is being shaved. If the person whose barber is giving him a bad haircut is in front of the mirror and instead the barber is top notch, it's not my head. Why will I cry more than the bereaved? So since the common people in their millions have said they don't mind the subsidy being removed, all I can contribute to the discussion is a way by which there will be no strife, civil strife, out of it. Because sometimes you can order a dress that doesn't fit you, and when the is delivered to you, you start beating up the delivery man. I can tell you, you ordered it, it's not the delivery man's uh, problem. So, if you don't want it, you live with it. So, what I'm saying in that sense is that it is now the only contribution I can make to Nigerians now is how you can survive in this post subsidy era. And what ways are those? To survive, you need to take it like a man, you take it like an adult. You need to now hold your government responsible because subsidy removal alone will not block plug the holes in government's budgeting. And if you see what I am saying, I don't know if you have seen it, that since subsidy was removed and people are tracking and managing, I'm still seeing government vehicles traveling in large convoy across the street. You are still seeing them everywhere. So it looks like the people in government who have imposed movement restriction on people, who have imposed rationing of money on people, and remo reducing people's options for mobility, are themselves not constraining themselves. They continue to live like, because they're not the one paying for the fuel. And that is sim symbolic of what they are doing in other sectors. So you need to now pay attention to see that the reason why I'm having to tighten my belt, maybe I switch up my generator when I want to sleep at night, I shut down my office, like the whole of Kwara State now, the government says, the workers should come to work only three days in a week, which is probably going to affect productivity, but maybe they, they won't do it long term. When we are making all these adjustments, then you don't want to hear that somebody is taking one billion naira government money away 
government is wasting money on other things and things like that. And it's you who will be vigilant because those who are in the government are also the ruling classes of Nigeria. And they are already used to luxury and all of that. So what one billion naira would look to them is not what it looks to you. So if you don't start to complain, they will not see it. So if I go anywhere in my private life and you spend uh, five million naira to carry me only uh, to a place, I won't feel it because I'm a private person. But if I start staying in government, I may start to think that, oh, this is government money. And the owners of the money are the common people. And this is not the best of time for them. I may start to caution myself, but not everybody will caution themselves. So you might find that government officials are spending money like before, and that money you thought you will save is actually not being saved. And as for the subsidy that has been removed now, none of the money is saved. After government removes subsidy, let me let Nigeria understand it. After government removes subsidy now, government has not saved one error. They have no money. That's a fact. So don't let anybody tell you that from the money we save in this subsidy, something is coming. No. Even after removing the subsidy, the government is still having a huge deficit. And the money is not there. Therefore, government needs to do two things now. And Nigerians only can make the government do it. Because when you are in government, it is natural to forget that you work for the people. It is the people who need to remind you that you work for them. Therefore, government needs to increase the revenue and cut waste. If the Nigerian government does that, if the Nigerian government collects, in fact, just 80% of all the revenue that is due to government, and they put them in the book, Nigeria will be richer than Turkey, than the UK, in the life of, of Tinubu's administration. Just mark my word. If President Buhari can, um, President Tinubu can run the government efficiently, 80% as efficient as I will have run it, and they go and collect government revenue, and they put it inside our book, and we budget it to National Assembly. And they also cut waste, either by half, two thirds, or by 90% you won't have any of these debates. You will see infrastructure everywhere. You will see the common people having good schools. You will see people having better houses. You have trains running, you have everything. And you, you'll be very happy. You will not even remember that there's anything called subsidy or, or not. My fear is that if what happens to kerosene subsidy removal, diesel subsidy removal, LPFO subsidy removal also happens to petrol subsidy removal, then you will just be paying more money and getting the same bad outcome. All right. Uh, uh, that's interesting and uh, I believe um, irrational enough um, advice for anyone to take. So um, now that I have you here, I have the opportunity to ask. There are comments and, uh, will I say, rumors on, you know, flying around about a unity government that is uh, the President Tinubu administration imbibing others who he feels are good enough, you know, to have an impact, uh, such as yourself, uh, wherein, um, you know, you know, when democracy is described, they say it's uh, uh, the majority will have their way, the minority will have their say. And as uh, people have always had issues with, with this winner takes all nature of um, democracy. So that being said, uh, this particular policy is something that you are opposed to but do you see yourself being able to contribute in this unity government as uh, they are saying where uh, president Tinubu might be reaching out to you to bring you into the government would you you know agree to such you know in the interest of the people let me just say something clearly i'm already contributing right from here oh. well, i'm talking here now i'm not being paid for it i'm not so i'm contributing honestly and uh, critically and uh, patriotically. That's one contribution. One of the greatest contributions you can make to your country is just obey the law of that country. And if the law is not good to tell the country to change the law. Now, the idea of unity government and all of that is politicians' language. Mm. 
the politician's language of uh, trying to eat <coughs> from where they did not so. The constitution makes every government Nigeria a unity government. Whoever wins, without calling me, Tinubu cannot afford not to do a unity government. It doesn't need to call me. It doesn't need to call anybody. Because the law says, under our constitution, you must choose the Federal Executive Council in such a manner that every state has at least one person. So which means that every state is already present there. Our constitution says that you must get everybody involved. No group should dominate the government other than the other. So if the President Tinubu wants to make a united, a united government, which the constitution wants him to do, he doesn't have to call me. He can go to my town and pick another person. He can go to my state and pick another person. He can go to um, my age group and pick another person. It doesn't have to be me. I'm not the definition of unity government. So the president has a duty to run a government that will achieve the objective of what he sold to the people. If he considers anybody relevant to help him in doing that, that person, he can approach the person. And that person may unconditionally go and help him. That person may uh, give him conditions. But that person may refuse if the person feels that it's not in the best interest of the country or is personally not available. So, President Tinubu doesn't owe me anything. But if that, uh, if he doesn't owe if anybody. Would reach out. If anybody reaches out to me, just like you reach out to me and say, come on your show, I will come in the public interest. Yeah. So, but it, it doesn't mean that I owe you to appear on your show or you owe me to appear to invite me. In, in politics, I have run for president. I did not win the election. I'm still ready to serve my country and I'm very patient. The Tinubu himself, last time he was in government was 16 years ago. And he was patient, taking his time and getting this done. So I'm a very patient person. But it doesn't mean that if I have an opportunity to be of assistance to the government of my country, I will not be an assistant. But I'm not looking for a government job. I am not uh, feeling that they owe me any government job or anything like that. There are many ways I can help the country and I'm doing that already. And if anybody knows of a better way, I will also pursue that. But I don't believe in this idea of uh, if somebody uh, wins election, then all of you start to put pressure on the person to include you in his government. No, you should let him set up his government according to his image, according to his vision, and let him be responsible for the conduct and outcome of the people he has put in his government. Then you should put yourself as alternative. In case something goes wrong with our government and people want an alternative, you also provide an alternative. And if the government's dynamics is such that they become, uh, they're implementing things that you like, and you think that you can assist them, and they think that you can assist them, you can go assist them on that narrow issue. So if you want to take care, for example, you want to implement Chapter 2 of the Constitution, and, and you are struggling on how to go about it, I can say, I can help you. You, you know, structure is very well for you. You know? So that's okay. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Adewale Adebayo. It's been great having you here. Uh, hopefully we get to see more of you uh, as the this government uh, continues. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you very much, and uh, God bless Nigeria. Oh. All right, that's all we'll take on the program for today. I'll leave you now with some updates. Don't forget to join us every weekday, 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. The Polity comes to you live from Abuja on Kaftan TV, Channel 124, Star Times. Have a nice day. See you tomorrow. I am Amadine Oberi. Bye for now. <laughs>